So far, in our exploration of Commodore history, I've talked a lot about the different computers, but not so much about the disk drives. And to be honest, the disk drives were almost as important as the computers themselves when it came down to how they were used. And they also played an important role in why Commodore computers were never able to evolve in the marketplace, like the IBM PC, for example. Commodore's disk drives started back in the days of the PET, with these large metal drives based on the IEEE 488 interface. Using some extra hardware, it was possible to connect many computers to a single drive. For example, in this computer lab set up in the year 1980, you can see multiple PETs connected to a single disk drive. Now, This design made a lot of sense because the computers didn't really access the drive a lot, and therefore this could save a lot of money and space. If you want to learn more about the pet drives, I recommend you watch a video from 8-Bit Show & Tell on the topic, which I'll put a link to down in the description. And so, for the rest of this episode, I'm going to be focusing on the disk drives used with Commodore's home computers, starting with the Commodore 1540. So, the VIC-1540 was the first drive designed specifically for the VIC-20 and its IEC serial interface. It was released in 1982, which was roughly two years after the VIC-20 had come to market, meaning that initially VIC-20 users didn't have any access to a disk drive. Although a year earlier, Commodore did start selling a cartridge which would allow a VIC-20 to use a PET drive, but that was probably not a common solution. That was okay, however, because the best software for the VIC-20 tended to come on cartridge because these could hold up to 16K of ROM. Software that came on cassette or disc would have been loaded into RAM and the stock VIC-20 only had about 3K to spare. Granted, you could get memory expansions, but as we discussed before, most software developers would prefer to target the stock system, as that was where the largest user base would be. The cassette drive was cheap, and with 3K maximum file size, the speed wasn't even much of an issue. As such, disk drives were a bit of a luxury item for VIC-20 users, and really only the hardcore users bought them. However, the same year the VIC-1540 disk drive came out, so did the Commodore 64, which also shared the same disk drive interface with the VIC-20. However, the 1540 was not compatible with the C64, and the reason may surprise you. It was too fast. That's right, and if you follow the series up to this point, then you probably remember that Commodore drives were notoriously slow compared to the rest of the industry due to a bug in the original VIC-20. Despite that, the drive was still too fast to work on the C64, and the reason may surprise you. If you've ever watched a VIC-20 load a program from cassette, it looks like this. Not much to say, actually. But if you watch a Commodore 64 loader program from cassette, you'll notice the screen goes blank. Now, the reason for this has to do with the VIC-2 video chip used in the C64. It shares every other cycle with the CPU, much like the VIC-20 does. However, in the C64, it steals more than just every other cycle. On certain scan lines, it steals even more CPU cycles than usual. Now, we typically call these bad lines. Looking at the clock speeds, you can see the PAL C64 is definitely slower than the VIC-20, but the NTSC version looks a bit faster. However, what really isn't explained by these numbers is the effect the bad lines have. Since the CPU clock speed takes a dip every 8 scan lines, the C64 actually gets less work done than a VIC-20. Now, what's worse, because the clock isn't running at a stable rate, it makes things like serial timing routines far more difficult. In order to maintain compatibility with the same cassette format, the C64 kernel will disable the video chip during loads, which means the CPU can run at a constant speed. However, when loading from disk, they did not implement the screen blanking feature, which means the only way to solve the problem was to make the disk drive a little bit slower. And for this, the drive was changed to the VIC 1541. The only real difference between the VIC 1540 and the VIC 1541 is the badge on the front and slightly different ROM version. Otherwise, these drives are identical. The 1540 was not manufactured for very long, and therefore they're pretty rare and highly sought after by collectors. In fact, most of the ones that remain have had their ROM chips upgraded, so they're actually 1541 drives that just happen to say 1540 on the front of them. The C64 was initially treated much the same as the VIC-20, with the early games being on cartridge and cassette. However, it didn't take long for the disk drive to really take off, especially in North America. Uh, the situation with the C64 was exactly opposite of that of the VIC-20. Cartridges still held 16K, but using a disk, you could load programs that could utilize all of the C64's RAM. In fact, in many ways, you could go even further than that. A game could be much larger than 64K, and thus only loading in the parts that it needed when the time came. Thus, games on disk tended to have much more complexity, better graphics, and better sound than games on cartridge. 
And so it didn't take long until Commodore rebranded the disk drive again, this time matching the color to the C64 and removing the VIC branding from the drive. However, all three of these drives are still essentially the exact same plastic mold, same board inside, and except for the 1540 they even have the same ROM. Although the 1541 was at times distributed with different drive mechanisms, so this one for example has a lever to close the drive, but uh, both styles are very common. As we've talked about before, the Commodore IEC interface is just a serial port, and while it's notorious for being slow, it did have some significant advantages over competitors of the era. Uh, the inside of the disk drive had its own 6502 CPU, RAM, ROM, and it contained its own DOS. Uh, thus, the computer never needed to know anything about the physical media that was being used. All the computer did was request a file, and the drive would deliver that file. This meant that the computer didn't need to allocate any RAM area for any sort of DOS like an Apple II or an IBM PC would have needed to do. It also meant there was no need to disassemble the computer and install a disk controller card like an Apple or IBM. And surprisingly, it also meant you could in theory use a variety of media types including hard drives or different types of floppy disks without the computer really caring. The downside to this design meant that drives tended to be larger and more expensive than for other computers, and this was especially true when accounting for multiple drives on a single computer. Now, these drives were also notorious for overheating, especially when people blocked the top vents by laying things on top, and that's mostly because the drives also contained internal power supplies that produced a lot of heat. Back in the 1980s, nearly every computer used a different disk format that was incompatible with everyone else. Commodore was no exception. They used a format known as GCR. This meant that for every 4 bits of data written to the disk, actually 5 bits were written. And this was done to prevent any situation where more than 2 zero bits would occur in a row. A simple lookup table could be used to determine which 4 bits needed to be written or translate them back when reading. And while this seems inefficient, it was actually more efficient than many other systems of the time. Commodore also did a few other things different from everyone else. Uh, for example, on a typical IBM formatted disk, there are the same 9 sectors on the inner tracks as there are on the outer tracks, because the disk spins at a constant speed and the read-write speed of the head also remains the same. Commodore on the other hand used a system where more data was written to the outer tracks than to the inner. So the inner tracks have 17 sectors and the outer tracks have 21. This actually made more efficient use of the disk space. Another interesting thing is that most computers store the directory information starting at track 0, but Commodore drives stored it at track 18. Now this was probably done to reduce seeking time because the head would always be within 18 tracks of the directory track. The intended way to list a directory was actually to load a file called dollar sign from that device number. This actually causes the disk drive to construct a special basic program that you can list which will show the contents of the drive. The main problem with this design is that it will overwrite whatever program you have in RAM, so if you were in the middle of writing a basic program, you couldn't actually list the directory of a disk. Of course, this wasn't a huge problem since most Commodore users invested in some sort of fast load cartridge and every one of them added a feature where you could just type a short command to get the directory listing without overwriting your basic program. File names could be 16 characters in length and could be one of 5 file types. PRG files were program files and by far the most common. SEQ were sequential files or essentially text files. REL files are relative files which are sort of like primitive database files. Uh, user and DEL files are pretty rare and probably not worth talking about here. Also you could store a maximum of 144 files on a disk, which is a limitation of the directory, although that's a barrier few people ever encountered. Also Commodore DOS is not hierarchical, meaning there are no subdirectories, and files are always displayed in the order they are written to disk, so there is no alphabetical order. If you list a directory and ever see an asterisk next to a file type, that's called a splat file. Essentially, these are caused when a file is open for writing but the file is never closed. Uh, for example, if you pull the disk out while writing a file or if there were a program crash or power failure. One interesting fact about Commodore DOS is how it handles the location of the head. Most disk drives used sensors to figure out the head location. Apple disk drives eliminated the sensor to reduce cost and instead just sent the head back 40 tracks every time the power was turned on usually causing the head banging sound. Uh, this ensured the head would be at track zero before any disk access started. Well, Commodore drives also had no sensors, yet they don't bang their heads every time you power them on. So how does this magic happen? Well, one time you are certain to hear the sound is when you format a disk. Then as the disk is being formatted, the track number is written to every single track on the disk. And that way, even on a fresh power up, 
When you go to read a disc for the first time, the drive will know exactly what track it's on by just reading the header to the track. So under normal operation you won't hear any head banging. However, many copy protection schemes as well as corrupted disks uh, could still cause the drive head to bang, and if this happened often enough it could cause the drive head to go out of alignment, in which case it would stop reading disks properly, and therefore it would require service to realign the head. After formatting, listing a directory will show 664 blocks free on a newly formatted disk. So how much is that? Well, a block is 256 bytes, so 4 blocks is equal to 1K. And the 1541 drive had only a single head, which meant you could store about 170 kilobytes per side. If you wanted to use the other side, you'd have to flip the disk over and then it would be treated like an entirely different disk. If the disk didn't have a right protect notch on both sides, you would need to punch one yourself and there were special tools made just for doing that. In 1985, with the introduction of the Commodore 128, Commodore also introduced a new drive to match called the 1571. And besides having a very different visual appearance, the 1571 also added many new features. It supported the C128's burst mode, which meant it could finally transfer data at a really high speed. It also had two heads so that it could read both sides of the disk without having to flip it over. Now at first you might think that you could take a disk from a 1541 that has data on both sides and then read both sides in the 1571, but it doesn't work that way. The problem is when you flip a disk over in a 1541, the disk will be rotating in the opposite direction. And so to use both sides of the disk, you have to format the disk in a 1571 as a double-sided disk. And then that disk can only be read in a 1571 from that point on. However, when formatted, a blank disk would have 1,328 blocks free, so twice what the 1541 had. However, being that most commercial software wanted to target the 1541 for the widest compatibility, virtually no software was ever distributed on disks formatted for both sides, even software that was designed for the Commodore 128, because some 128 users were still using 1541 drives and never upgraded. Another benefit of the 1571 is that it had a track 1 sensor. This almost completely eliminated the head banging problem since it would always know when the head had made it back to track 1, so there was no reason to keep trying to move it. This helped over the long term with keeping the heads in proper alignment. And yet one more benefit of the 1571 is that the controller is more flexible and can read MFM formats as well as the Commodore GCR format. This allowed for compatibility with CPM software, and that meant when using a Commodore 128, it was possible to read disks from machines like the K-Pro, for example. However, this was also exploited to allow the drive to read and write disks formatted for IBM PCs, or MS-DOS. It required a special program on the computer side to be able to read the disks, and just because you could read them doesn't mean you could execute programs or anything, but this could be helpful for transferring things like text files from one format to another. And while a minor detail, the 1571 also introduced dip switches to the back of the drive so you could easily change the device number without taking the drive apart. And one last important benefit is that when a 1571 is attached to a Commodore 64 or a Commodore 128 that's running in 64 mode, the drive will also go into a 1541 emulation mode so that it will be compatible with any software designed to work in a 1541. During the early days of the 1571, Commodore was having trouble keeping up with the demand in some regions, so as a stopgap measure, the 1570 was born. It used the same case molds as the traditional 1541, but on the inside you can see the board is essentially a 1571 board being held in place with some custom brackets. The drive mechanism itself is still a single-sided drive with just one head, but it does have the faster burst mode for the C128 and also includes a Track 1 sensor. So it's very much a hybrid between a 1541 and a 1571. The 1570 is pretty rare these days as it wasn't made for very long. And interestingly enough, you can actually see a 1570 on the floor in the movie Ready Player One. Of course, after Commodore switched to making the 64C instead of the bread bin, they also changed the 1541's color yet again, back to white or light beige color. They called this the 1541C, although there's no actual markings on the drive referring to it as such. It's essentially identical to previous 1541 drives, um, except for the color and the badging. However, shortly after, they introduced the 1541-2, and this has the same external design language as the 1571, but as you can see, it's quite a bit smaller. It's also quite a bit lighter, and while functionally it's identical to the regular 1541, one major improvement is that the power supply was removed from inside the case to an external brick. This greatly improved the issues with heat buildup inside, which made the drives considerably more reliable, and it also does have dip switches for the device number. 
1581 was introduced in 1987, well towards the end of the 8-bit era. This drive uses 3.5 inch double density disks, and because very little Commodore software would ever be distributed on this format, the main benefit of this drive was that it had a lot of storage on a single disk. A freshly formatted disk would have 3,160 blocks free, and that was a colossal amount for a Commodore machine as that would be roughly five times what you could store on a 1541 disk. As such, these were popular with BBS operators often having more than one of these drives, giving their file transfer section a lot more files to pick from. They were also popular with people who used Geos, especially Geos 128. They could store a lot of data and they supported burst mode so they were very fast. They could also read MS-DOS formatted disks, just like the 1571. Again, they couldn't read this format natively, but with the use of a special transfer program on your computer. Despite not being directly supported by any games and virtually no commercial software, they were very popular with hobbyists and BBS operators and power users, and uh, therefore these are highly sought after today and they do tend to fetch top dollar when they show up for sale. Also worth mentioning is the Commodore 1551 disk drive, which was made primarily for the Commodore 16, Plus 4, and other TED-based computers. Now, while using the traditional 1541 case mold, the 1551 gets rid of the serial port and plugs straight into the cartridge port of these computers. This did solve the speed problem, of course, as these drives were very fast. However, these drives do not work on the Commodore 64, or the 128, or the VIC-20 because they do require the custom cartridge port of the Plus 4, or the, the C16, or 116, or any of the other TED series that are out there. In fact, these drives are actually pretty rare because even the TED machines had standard serial ports just like the 1541, and so those users wound up using standard disk drives more often than not. So these are actually pretty rare and fetch top dollar when, uh, when they do come up for sale. Up to this point, every drive I've shown you has been actually manufactured by Commodore, but what you may not know is that there were also numerous third-party drives developed by other companies that were compatible with Commodore's ecosystem. So each one of these third-party drives has at least one or two interesting tidbits of things I want to tell you about. So I'm going to start with the MSD drive. This was actually one of the first drives. This thing's actually really heavy too. <laughs> now this is actually a dual drive. It has two drives in the front of it. Um, they also made a single drive version of this, which I do not have. The MSD SD2 is an industrial looking drive with a metal case on it. Now, this particular one has been modded with toggle switches to set the drive number, a practice I'm not fond of, especially when placed right on the front like this. There's also a drive reset button. There's another toggle switch on the rear that I'm not even sure what purpose it serves. Then it has the regular two serial ports, like any Commodore drive, but also has an IEEE 488 port so that this drive can work with PET computers as well, which were still popular at the time of this drive's release. In fact, it shares something else in common with the PET drives, which is how it handles having two drives on the system. To demonstrate this, I'll insert Planet X2 into Drive 0, and then Ghostbusters into Drive 1. To get a directory from Drive 0, you simply add a 0 after the dollar sign. And, as you can see, Drive 0 will fire up, and yep, there's the directory for Planet X2. And then, to get the directory of Drive 1, you just type this, and again, Drive 1 will fire up, and there's your directory. Of course, to actually access a specific file, you must place a 0 or a 1, followed by a colon, and then the file name. Or in this case, I'm using an asterisk to represent the first file on the disk. Now, the problem with this is, of course, some software will have to load in additional files afterwards. If no drive number is specified, the drive will usually assume drive 0, so some software will fail to load correctly from drive 1. The MSD drives were very popular with BBS operators because they could store essentially twice the amount of data as a single 1541 disk drive. They were also very popular at copy parties because they were designed to be able to copy from one drive to the other very quickly and accurately. <laughs> but uh, moving along, um, I want to talk now about the Indus GT. The Indus GT has a very refined outward appearance as compared to the industrial look of the MSD drive. The front face is supposed to open by pushing the button, but mine needs a bit of help. Of course, the cover doesn't really do anything other than just look cool. On the rear, it has the two Commodore serial ports, and then these mystery auxiliary ports, which nobody knows what are for. Even the manual says they're for future use, whatever that means. Then there are dip switches for setting the device number. Oh, and as you can see, it uses an external power supply. This is how the drive ended up being a good bit smaller than the 1541 of the era, and probably helped keep it from overheating as well. When powering up, you may notice it has a little two-digit screen here. Now this does a few different things. Uh, for example, it usually shows the track number, so if I tell it to load the directory, you'll see it jump to track 18. 
Of course, there's no disk in the drive, so I can show you the second use for it, which is displaying error codes. You can look these up in the manual, but over time most people would remember the common error codes. And this one means drive not ready. But I think the most fascinating thing about the Indus GT is its built-in ROM drive. And the way you access it is just like a dual drive such as the MSD I just showed. So if you load a dollar sign one like this, you'll get a special directory of files stored in the drive's ROM that you can load. You can load the first one like this, which uh, stands for Fast IO and DOS Wedge. And so what this does is essentially like a fast load cartridge. It replaces the internal drive commands in the C64 with easier to use features and faster loading routines. For example, you can use a slash to load a regular file. And in this case, since I still haven't put a disk in the drive, it will also display an error message on the screen without even asking, which is pretty neat. Although you can also use the at symbol to check the drive status as well. You can also get a directory reading like this without erasing your basic program. So all pretty useful stuff. And you may be wondering what the fast copy thing is on the drive. Well, as you can see, it's a full disk copier. Not very fancy, but it works. I should also mention that there was an Atari version of the Indus GT, which I believe was actually made first. And as you can see, it looks exactly the same in the front, but on the rear, it has the Atari SIO ports instead. So buying an Indus GT drive would be kind of like buying a Commodore drive plus a fast load cartridge. Although granted the fast load cartridge would probably be a little bit more convenient because with the uh, Indus GT you do have to type a command every time you power on the system in order to get access to the fast load features. Now before I talk about the next three drives I need to talk about a little problem with making drives completely compatible with Commodore computers. You see, the protocol used by Commodore's IEC disk drive port is pretty simple, and it wouldn't be hard to build a third-party device that would allow users to load and save files over that protocol. The problem is that the 1541 is itself a computer, and it's possible to upload code into the drive itself to change the behavior of the drive. This is how all of the fast loaders work, and it's also why you can run the drive music program, unplug the disk drive from the computer, and the drive will keep making music on its own. It's also how certain copy programs would allow you to unplug the drives from the computer and the drives would continue to copy any disks you insert into them on their own. However, this feature was also used by many copy protection schemes. In fact, many games used entirely foreign, non-standard disk formats. Only track 18 needed to remain compatible with the Commodore format, just enough to load the directory and the first file. After that, the rest of the disk could be an entirely foreign format designed specifically for that game. And after a few years on the market, practically every piece of commercial software was completely dependent on the 1541 disk drive being exactly how it was. If you changed any part of it, it would break compatibility with hundreds or thousands of software titles. That includes the ROM code. So while it would be easy enough to design a disk drive that would be compatible enough for users to load and save their own programs to disk, in order to be a commercially successful product, it would need to be able to load commercial games. This presented a problem for third-party drives. They could copy the design of the motherboards easy enough since they were mostly off-the-shelf parts. But the ROM code was the biggest barrier to creating a fully compatible disk drive. Some companies like the Accelerator Plus simply copied Commodore's ROM code as is, and as you might expect, they were sued by Commodore for it. So they agreed not to use their own code, but what they really did was take the original ROM code and swap around some of the bits, which changes all the values to look like nonsense if you were to read the chip in an EEPROM programmer. However, in order to make the chip still work, they just swapped around the matching traces on the board so that it all ended up making sense in the end. Of course, Commodore quickly figured this out and sued again, eventually taking this drive off the market. It's often discussed online that many of these drives, if not all of them, were targets of lawsuits by Commodore at one point or another. But the truth is, in my research, I was only able to find specific information about the lawsuit against the Accelerator Plus. So while it's very possible Commodore may have sued the Enhancer 2000 or the Indus GT or the MSD drives, I just don't know for sure. It wouldn't surprise me, but I just can't find any information on it. The Enhancer 2000 was a very common third-party drive that seemed to be mostly 1541 compatible. And there's not a lot to really say about this other than it's the only third-party drive that matches the color scheme of the Breadbin C64. And the last drive I have here is the blue chip drive. They actually made several different models, but this is one of the last models they made. And the thing that makes it unique is that it's actually not a clone of the 1541, but rather it's a clone of the 1571. So this drive was targeted for Commodore 128 users and it supports all of the features of the 1571. And there's one very important third party drive which I don't have. So I'm gonna let Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell tell you all about it. Hi, it's Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell. I have here the Creative Micro Designs 
FD2000, which is a 3.5 inch high density drive. It's much like Commodore's 1581, but that only accepts double density disks. This also works with high density disks. It formats the disk to 1.6 megabytes, which is almost 10 times as much as a Commodore 1541 can store on one disk side. The FD2000 is a little smaller than the 1581 in width and depth, and it has the same serial ports, allows configuration of up to 16 different device numbers, and is powered by 9 volts DC. Using the included FD Utilities program, you're able to partition a disk into several smaller 1541, 1571, or 1581 partitions, as well as program the optional real-time clock. There was also an FD4000 model available that used the rare ED disks and could store up to 3.2 megabytes, but I don't have one of those. But I do have something even more rare. This is a dual FD2000. As far as I know, only three of these were ever made. You could almost call it a prototype, but it's more of a custom build that was used for disk copying. You can see on the included disk, Make Master, for use only with the FD copier, a custom version of the FD2000. The case is kind of ugly. They took a regular FD2000 and just added this extra bracket at the bottom here. And on the back, it's even open. This was used by Lodestar for duplicating their monthly disk magazine. So it made thousands and thousands of copies very reliably for Lodestar. I'll be doing a more in-depth video about this disk drive in a future video on my channel, 8-Bit Show & Tell, so please subscribe. Unlike 10 years earlier, by the late 1980s, compatibility was a driving force in the computer industry. Nobody wanted to produce products or even buy products that weren't compatible in some way or another. And because the vast majority of games utilized special disk formats and copy protection on the 1541 disks, that meant a 1541 or 100% compatible disk drive was a requirement for owning and using a Commodore 64. Unlike IBM PCs, for example, which rarely ever used this sort of copy protection. In fact, by this time, most IBM compatible games were more or less expected to be copied or installed onto your hard drive for execution. But this simply wouldn't be possible with Commodore software because they were so heavily intertwined with the 1541 disk drive. And while I'm sure that made Commodore happy because they were able to sue other manufacturers trying to create 100% compatible Commodore drives, it also meant they sort of painted themselves into a corner because the Commodore 8-bit line would never be able to move beyond the 5 quarter inch floppy disk, unlike competitors like the IBM PC, for example. And like I said, it's probably not the only reason for the decline of the Commodore 8-bit ecosystem, but it was certainly a contributing factor. And of course, that about wraps it up for this episode of Commodore History, so stay tuned for the next one, and as always, Thanks for watching.